Capital punishment. Should governments be able to kill really bad people? This is a tricky conversation because there are a lot of layers to this. First, there's the obvious layer of should governments have the power to kill people? Then we have other layers of decency. How might they do it in a decent way, a way that society considers it to be okay or acceptable? Or is there simply no decent standard for killing criminals? And the cost layer, uh, we should just keep them in prison because it's far too expensive to have them going through appeals process after appeals process to avoid being killed. Let's just get rid of the death penalty, not just because of the decency maybe, but because of the cost. Well, how about this? In a modern era, the belief is governments and people in generally should not be in the business of murder. That's what bad people do. That's what, and the word murder is a bit tricky here because for capital crime or capital punishment, the idea is that you're not murdering an innocent person. So it's not murder. It's something else. It's justice. It's retribution. It's a penalty of some kind. It's uh, for some, it's retaliation, even revenge. But the idea is not murder, which is the intentional killing of an innocent person. So what is your take? Should governments have the power or the obligation to kill? Some basic terminology now. Capital punishment is officially sanctioned, so government sanctioned or laws of a land sanctioned. Death for very bad crimes. Death for very bad crimes. An abolitionist, that's a wordy word, abolitionist is one who wants to do away with capital punishment. They want to abolish it. The death penalty is never justified for the abolitionist. Retentionist, just like the word sounds, wants to retain the death penalty as a part of the legal system because sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it's warranted. It should be in the possible toolkit of how governments respond to criminal activity, bad people. An interesting part of this conversation is that while some countries have it or don't have it, even within countries like the U.S., different states differ radically on their views of capital punishment. Texas is famous for being a state that executes its criminals far more than any other state in the U.S., and not all states believe that it's a good thing to have or to do. So who's right? Are they all right? Probably not. These seem to be mutually exclusive views. That is, if you support the abolitionist, it's very hard to also simultaneously support the retentionist. These are going in different directions. So how do we make sense of this? What do we do with this? It's a bit of a squishy stat, but generally speaking, this seems to be true, that only five countries in the entire world account for over 80, almost 90% of all known executions. So five countries in the entire world. These include China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and the United States. So China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and the United States. I'm just looking at the overall political views of these different countries and what they're generally known for, stereotyping, of course. Um, these are wildly different. Uh, the United States and Pakistan shares with Saudi Arabia, that shares with Iran, shares with, shares with China. But the rest of the world, not so much. Why is that? Why is it that most industrialized nations, large countries in the world, have shunned capital punishment? They think it's somehow improper or immoral, and so they've made it illegal. But these five countries have held on to it. What's going on? Everyone seems to be struggling with the question. For example, in the United States between 1972 and 1976, capital punishment was suspended in large part because of Furman v. Georgia, in which the idea of capital punishment seemed arbitrary. It seemed to be cruel, and it seemed to be unusual. Cruel and unusual punishment is the term I'm sure you've heard before. So they suspended it for that period of time. Why? What is it about this question that gets so many people on such diametrically opposed positions, opposing one another, fundamentally believing the other person to be the enemy of justice? In 1976, the Canadian Criminal Code was changed and capital punishment was removed. 1976, so not super long ago. The decision was based on the idea that, and we've heard this no doubt before, that people get these things wrong. We convict people who turn out to be innocent. And should the state be in the business of convicting people who turn out to be innocent and therefore be responsible basically for murder? Well, not just basically, overtly responsible for murder, the intentional killing of an innocent person who doesn't ask for it. Having a country responsible for that level of moral depravity uh, is, is not good. So simply the fear of getting it wrong has 
migrated or motivated many people to do away with this idea of capital punishment. There's also the problem of, does it work? When we think about it for a moment, people who are doing these really bad crimes, they don't seem to be motivated by social norms. They don't seem to be motivated by what other people will think about me. They're motivated by, uh, I don't know if it's greed or rage or mental imbalance or what it is, but these people do these terrible crimes. And the idea is that if we think having a law on the books that capital punishment is a thing, that that's somehow going to dissuade these unstable, weird, uh, oddball criminals, murderers, psychopaths, that we're probably missing the point. These are not rational people. I'm generalizing, of course, and maybe that's not the case. Maybe some of them are very rational. But does it actually work? Does it dissuade evil? In Canada, by 1869, before it was abolished, capital crime was allowable punishment by death for murder, rape, and treason. Murder, rape, and treason. Those are the only crimes. If you committed those, so not theft, uh, not, you know, burning down a barn or something like that, unless there was somebody in it and you, you tried to kill them. All told in Canada, there were 1,481 people sentenced to death. 710 were actually executed. 710. Of those, 13 were women. The rest were men. Then, of course, the idea was that it was no longer proper and they got rid of it. Why? Why did Canada get rid of the death penalty? The same reasons we've already talked about and the ones you hear from many other countries around the world. Fear that we're going we're gonna to get it wrong. I would be afraid if I was responsible for deciding life and death. If I got that wrong, it's not like a driver's test where if I get it wrong, I don't get my driver's license. In this case, you end up being a murderer, not the harbinger or the bringer of justice. Two, there's just general concerns with the idea that the government states people with power, law, law, not just lawyers, but judges, statesmen, why, are, why do they have such power to decide life and death? There are concerns that people have too much power. The government has too much power to decide life and death. It doesn't matter if you're a judge or lawyer. Even if you got doctors involved, there's this idea that human beings shouldn't have that kind of power over other human beings. Now the, the twist in this is, of course, that doctors do have these sorts of powers and that governments do have these sorts of powers. They make decisions every day that very much condition people's lives in some cases, whether they live or die, whether they get the right medical treatment to sustain life, whether it's government funded or not, and so on and so on. So people are making these decisions, but still the concern is and was that uh, just generally speaking, the state should not be in the business of directly taking lives. All right. Three, the uncertainty of it as a deterrent. Is there evidence to support that this actually works if we kept it around? And it hasn't been clear at all that it actually works as a deterrent. And in the very least, it's ambiguous or vague. Uh, study after study it comes up with slightly different results, but it doesn't seem to be something that we can point to and say, oh, clearly this will prevent crime and help society overall. You will need to research those stats, make a great research paper, uh, because there are so many contradictory opinions on how to read the numbers. But again, in countries that still have it, in countries that have not just capital crime, but brutal punishments, uh, why is it that they have so much crime? Is it that they're overly strict and what constitutes a crime in those countries means that more and more people get uh, basically ravaged by the justice mach machine that beheads them and does all kinds of other crazy things? Or is it that as a dissuasive force, maybe it just doesn't, doesn't have the impact that they hope or they assume? It doesn't matter how barbarous a country becomes, violence doesn't end. Under the retentionist argument, that is the people who want to keep capital punishment, there are two big arguments. The first one is that it does prevent criminals from doing bad things. It's a deterrent. It's a deterrent. Again, it's not clear that that's the case at all, but let's say maybe one case out of a million, it is a deterrent. Well, that's one case out of a million where it wouldn't have been a deterrent. So there's some progress there. Under retentionism, we also have this thing called retributivism. Retributivism. It's basically saying that we, we people deserve it. They've earned it. By doing something bad, murdering other people, capital crime, they deserve this, a proportional response, an equal proportional response. So if you've killed somebody, guess what? We're going to do the same thing to you. And there are different ways of arguing for that retributivism that I can almost say clearly. Uh, Emmanuel Kant will be someone who, who, who works on this, who says that uh, capital punishment is something that we deserve. We deserve to be punished if we're treating people with respect. Uh, 
If we're treating people as rational human beings who have made rational decisions to murder other people, to do these really bad things, then as a society, it becomes this lexus talionis, basically an eye for an eye, where it is our responsibility to respect this person's decisions. And in respecting what they've done, they get murder too. They, they're not murder, but they get capital crime, which some still consider to be murder. The counter argument to Immanuel Kant is saying, well, you're not really treating people as responsible adults by killing them because these people may not be making free rational choices. These people may be subject to all kinds of influences and factors and uh, lifetimes, uh, a lifetime of slavery that has so conditioned them that the only way that they could find a way out was through violence. So it's not that people are making rational decisions and now we're going to respect them as autonomous, rational individuals. It's they're desperate for survival or they're desperate for something else. And obviously I'm generalizing here, but that's one of the counterclaims is that while we want to think of people as rational individuals making these reflective choices in life that lead to things like murder, it's not clear that that's the case at all. So we treating people as respect-worthy, rational individuals is not necessarily what they've been living. So how does that connect? The abolitionist argument to say, let's get rid of this thing, there are a few of them. Now let's look at five. No one deserves the death penalty. It doesn't matter who you are or how bad your crime is, you don't deserve the death penalty. That's a tough sell, but this is basically arguing that life, human life, is of such significant worth that even a person who does everything they can to destroy other human life, even a person who is just utterly repugnant, a terrible human being, that person still has something called life that we need to respect. Even though we don't respect the person per se and their actions and what they've done, they still don't deserve death. That's a hard argument to make, but there it is. Uh, another one is that life in prison for murderers produces the greatest overall happiness for society. This is going to sound trite, but let's have these murderers, instead of killing them, let's put them in prison and put them to work right, to make license plates. I don't know if they actually do that anymore, but let's say we're going to make them do something of service to society. They earn their keep. They, they're, they're out of society, so they can't hurt anybody. And overall, they're doing jobs that maybe we don't want to do. So they're useful, which leads to greater happiness overall than just ending their lives and being done with it. Yes, it would be very costly. Prison is very costly. But overall, we're supposed to gain a net value. This is a big argument for retentionists, which is that all people have the right to life. Everyone has the right to life. And just because someone has taken that away from another person, they still have a right to life. We would simply be doing two wrongs. This person did a wrong by hurting somebody else. Now, as a state, as a government, we're going to do another wrong to correct that first one. The first wrong can't be corrected by doing another wrong here. Essentially, everyone has a right to life, and when we start to do this capital punishment thing, is the concern for retentionists is that we are clearly discriminating against minorities and the poor. Those are the ones who will more often than not end up on death row. Time and time again, why is that? Well, maybe because they're already disadvantaged and they're more inclined towards crime and doing bad things to get themselves out of a situation. Um, you know, white collar crime, what's the motivation for murdering? And uh, despite all the shows you've seen, whether it's detective shows like uh, uh, Monk or something like that, uh, SUV, all these different detective shows where people who are really rich end up murdering people, that seems really rare. For the most part, people end up on death row are not the uber elite, wealthy, rich. They're the, um, they're the marginalized, the poor. And finally, if the punishment is meant to fit the crime, we can't do that. We can't fit the crime. The crime is something done uh, by an individual, presumably an individual to another individual, in a way that the state can't do that. We can't take a, a Jeffrey Dahmer and, and, f and do the same things to him that he did to other people. It just doesn't work that way. Against the death penalty, you'll often hear the discrimination argument that I've just touched on briefly. But the, I the idea for retentionists who want to keep it is not that the death penalty itself discriminates, that the death penalty itself focuses on uh, the minority groups, the marginalized, the poor. It just so happens that it's being applied inappropriately. So the death penalty is a good idea, they argue, but its application has failed because of the bureaucracy, the bureaucratic nightmare of government of trying to decide who did the wrong and lawyers and judge, all these different people that get involved with this, human beings screw it up. So if we can figure out how to do the death penalty 
fairly and appropriately, then it's a good idea. But even retentionists who want to keep it can admit that it so far hasn't been applied fairly, that there's a disproportional group of people who are being targeted, and that needs to end. It's worth taking a minute to ask ourselves, what is it that we expect of punishment? So we have someone who's done something bad, a murderer. We have DNA evidence. We know this person did something really bad. It's beyond the pale, so to say. What is the point of punishment going forward? What is it that we want to achieve with our justice system? Some will say the goal of the goal of any kind of punishment is rehabilitation. No one wins if we simply let the criminal stay the way they are, psychologically, emotionally, physically. We need to make this person better, to reshape this person, rehabilitate them in a way that benefits them, wonderfully, but also society. We can do something with this person rather than just kill them to rehabilitate them. Punishment needs to be corrective. To rehabilitate the person means to make things better rather than just killing the person and calling it a day. Others will say, no, 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 no. The, the point of punishment is not to make people better. That's too lofty. It's too costly. It's far too involved. And there's no guarantee. And if you think you made a person better and you let them go, wow, you, you have no idea. And recidivism, which is the rate of another crime or repeating the same crime, um, that can be very high. So we can't take that chance. Instead, the point of punishment is deterrence that we've already talked about. We need to stop other criminals. How we do that? How do we get the best form of deterrence? Well, maybe we make this person uh, an example, right? really terrify people with all of the bad things that we do to this individual. I'm teaching a film class right now, and in that film class, we are watching Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. It's a movie that's very difficult to watch because it's very gory and violent, and it's supposed to be a historical depiction of the crucifixion of Christ, of Jesus, where he's taken by the Romans and literally nailed to wood and there's, you know, whipping and all kinds of torture. Okay, how historical it is, it's not clear, but it seems to be largely historically accurate. And the takeaway for many students is that this form of capital punishment by the Romans was meant to be horrendous, hideous, terrifying. It was meant as a symbol to all other criminals. Don't do what we don't want you to do, or you will end up like this person on the cross, a slow, terrible death, suffocation and bleeding. Just, just, it was torture in every sense of it. So that cruel and unusual phrase that we have before, the cruel and unusual, that applies to that crucifixion scene and all, everyone else being crucified as well. Would that act as a deterrent? If your country started crucifying people, as the Romans did, would that act as a deterrent? And if it does, then for some people it's justified. From a strictly utilitarian perspective, a utilitarian or consequentialist view is often, is often this. We want the most amount of happiness for the most number of people. The most amount of happiness for the most number of people. So a government that punishes people by hurting people in any way is producing pain and suffering. And that's against the consequentialist view. They want happiness for all. But if you go a little deeper for the consequentialist view, short-term pain, short-term punishment overall works in a utilitarian fashion to produce greater happiness. So for some utilitarians who say we all ought to be seeking happiness, we all ought to be seeking happiness for others, capital punishment might be feasible, it might be possible, if the end result, because the ends justify the means for utilitarians, if the end result is more happiness. So would capital punishment lead to greater happiness overall? I, it's a very big question, but to be moral for utilitarians, it has to. It's worth pointing out that there are two different forms of deterrence. There's deterrence for the individual, so the individual doesn't do this thing again. But there's also general deterrence where others see what happened to this individual and they realize, oh, I, oh, I don't want to be in that situation. I'm not going to do what that person did. So there's individual and then there's a larger social deterrence. Most people focus in capital punishment. They're thinking about social deterrence because the individual is going to die if you retain capital punishment or implement capital punishment. The final form of why are we punishing people is retribution. We have deterrence as one argument. We have this idea of fixing somebody, making them better. But now we have this idea of retribution. They deserve it. They've harmed others. And now, to the degree that they've harmed others, we need to harm them. It's a very simple equation. It's not meant to be complicated. We have a system in place. Again, Lexis Talianus, an eye for an eye. If you've taken bread from somebody, then we'll take it from you. 
and we'll do our best uh, to make some kind of retribution. The trick with retribution is that the punishment needs to be equivalent, but not identical. So if someone steals bread, we're not literally just going to take the bread away from this person. We'll garnish their wage. We'll take some of their income. We'll put a lien on their house. I don't know. Maybe it's very expensive bread. So it doesn't have to be the identical treatment. It has to be equivalent. And who decides that? Who decides an equivalent punishment for someone who has murdered another person? Is it just simply murder? Or is there something else involved? Consider historically that if one individual committed a crime some countries would punish the whole family. So it wouldn't be equivalent. It would be a disproportional response, uh, again, as, a, as a, a form of deterrence, in which your entire family would suffer because of a crime that you committed. That's something that in Western countries we would never even imagine, but that is certainly something that's happened in the past. Some of the questions we will want to ask, is life imprisonment less of a deterrent, deterrent than capital crime? For me, if I was already desperate in life for food or desperate and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about some kind of criminal activity just to, to make ends meet or to do something and I end up killing somebody by accident, maybe say I'm robbing a store and I, and I kill the, the clerk by accident, well, I've, I've murdered somebody, they didn't ask for it. And even though it was by accident, it might not be first degree murder, but now I'm looking at death row for my crime. If I'm desperate, and they're offering me basically euthanasia, a way out of life, that's kind of a deterrent depending on how desperate I am. I may actually welcome that. As someone, I've actually worked in a maximum security prison for a little while as a pastoral counselor. And during that time, there were a number of people, well, not a number, maybe three people um, in two years that I was there that said they would go out when they've committed a crime, they would be released and they would go out and they would repeat the crime so they could get back into the system because it's the only thing they've ever known. And it's safe. They get fed. They get water. They get, you know, they get education. They get TV, all these different things. In other words, the deterrent that most of us would consider for capital crime or imprisonment isn't the same kind of deterrent for those who are desperate, who are, who are only ever known the criminal justice system as their home. It's really tough then to say that these things are going to act as a deterrent. We have to grapple with this idea that this person has a right to life, but have they invalidated their own claim to the right to life by taking that from somebody else? By taking somebody else's life, invalidating their claim, have they simultaneously taken away their own or reduced their own in some meaningful way, such that the state can then decide capital punishment is appropriate? I don't have an answer for that. For me personally, there are strong grounds that a mass murderer, for example, who hasn't just killed one person but killed multiple people with a complete disregard for their humanity, I would have a hard time thinking that person still has a claim to something that they've denied other people. The problem is then are we in a position as a society, as a government, a system of rules, to do something equivalent, that is to take away the right to life that he did to other people? And do we want to share in that activity? So it's very selfish now, very ego, not egotistical, very selfish of us. Do we want our hands to be bloody like his hands were bloody or her hands? Do we want to be that kind of society? And the answer for most industrialized nations is no. They don't want to be a partner in this. And so they've abolished this capital crime thing. As for myself, my position has been for a long time that I don't think the government should have the power of life and death. And then I hear about some of these criminals in Canada specifically, and they're just the unbelievable inhumanity, the evil of some people and the things that they do to others. And it's very hard to see the right to life. It's very hard to see respect for personhood. It's very hard to see, and this is a rational human being. So my own position oscillates depending on the, the gravity of the situation. And going forward as a society, things will change. We have easy testing now with DNA, reliable rapid testing for the most part, DNA testing. We have widespread surveillance culture, whether you agree with that or not. We have a lot of uh, availability digital recording so when someone commits a crime it's much easier than it has been to be absolutely sure they committed the crime so of the reasons that Canada had abolished capital punishment certainly the one about getting it wrong seems less and less of an issue 
but might it deter criminals? Is there room for rehabilitation? And do we have the right to take back from people something they've taken from others? These are questions I can't answer, but there we are.